Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship. And today we continue our Easter celebration and continue to rejoice in the victory that Christ has won for us, the victory that is made ours by faith. Now, of course, Easter would really mean nothing to us personally if we didn't know about it. Right? If we didn't know about the cross, if we didn't know about the empty tomb, or if we just, just dismissed it as a fable, well, then Easter would mean nothing to us personally. And so today we rejoice and give thanks to God to know that, that he has brought us out of such spiritual blindness, and he has given us the eyes of faith to see and to know our Savior and the victory that he won. You have the order of service printed for you on the pages of your, your worship folder, and we'll begin with our opening hymn, Hymn 442, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. God bless your worship this morning. Please stand. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. 
In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. O oh God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our first lesson. Our first lesson for this morning is the conversion of Saul, later known as the Apostle Paul. Uh, to get his attention, we, we see that, that Jesus struck him blind. And then God not only restored Saul's physical sight, but, but even more importantly, he gave him the spiritual sight of faith to know Jesus as his Savior, to know the true God. We'll read from Acts chapter 9, uh, the first 22 verses. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come up and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the word of our Lord. In our second lesson the Apostle Paul compares his former life, his life prior to his conversion, to his new life after he had been given the eyes of faith to know salvation in Christ. We'll read it from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. The Apostle Paul writes, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. 
As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this, or that I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do know, I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of our Lord. I invite you to please stand for the reading of our gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson for today, it continues the the Easter story. And we have before us the record of Jesus' third appearance to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. We read from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also also known as Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. Invite the children to come forward for a children's message. Coming, Allie? <laughs> well, good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. Everyone doing good? So far, so good. So today, I wanted to try a little exercise, and I'm going to need a volunteer to be blindfolded. All right, you know, Michael, why don't you, since I stole your goggles for this, why don't you do this, because I know they'll fit. You want to come up here and put these goggles on? All right, so you put those on. Actually, wait, I'll have you stand. So you don't have to walk blindfolded. I'll have you stand where you need to stand first. Okay, so you stand right here, and you put these goggles on, okay? All right. Are they on good? No peeking? All right. So I want you to tell me, I'm holding up a picture. Can you tell me what this is a picture of? 
Can you tell me what it is? Can you, well, try looking harder. Can you tell me what it is? Nothing? All right, all right. Our experiment worked. You could take the goggles off. You had no idea what the picture was of? Oh, man. All right. You can take a seat. Can I get one more volunteer? Brandon, you want to come help with this one? So you stand exactly where Michael was, okay? Now, can you tell and explain to Micah what this picture is of? Can you see that? What's that? Tell Micah what it is a picture of. It's a cat with a soccer ball. I just Googled uh, silly images, and this is what came up. But it's a cat that's really excited to have a soccer ball in his hand. Just because. Thank you, Brandon. That was it. So, Micah, why didn't you know what was the picture was of? Why couldn't you tell? Yeah, because you were blindfolded. You couldn't see. There was tape on the goggles. So you had no idea what that picture would be of unless someone told you, right? You needed Brandon to tell you what that picture was of, right? Because you were blinded, you couldn't see. And so you needed someone else to tell you. Well, in that Bible story that I read just a little while ago, we heard about a man who lived a long time ago, It lived in the Bible times, a man named Saul. And Saul had no idea who God was. Saul didn't know God. But one day while he was traveling on the road, Jesus appeared to him in this big, bright, brilliant light. Jesus appeared to Saul And Jesus told Saul who God the Father is and what God has done for him to save him. And so in a way we could say that that Jesus opened up Saul's eyes to see and to know God. And Saul was so excited to know who God is and what he has done to save him that you know what Saul did? He spent the rest of his life telling other people about God, about Jesus. Well, did you guys know when you were born as babies, can you remember that far back? you remember being a baby? Probably not. Well, you remember, you have some memories? But when you came into this world as a baby, did you know you, don't, you didn't know who God was? You didn't know who God was when you were born in this world. You couldn't see him, you couldn't know him or his, or his love for you. You didn't know who God was. And you know what the Bible describes that? As being spiritually blind. Right? You couldn't see God, you couldn't know God. But do you know God now? You know who God is? You know what he's done for you? How do you know? How do you know, Mila? From the Bible, right? God loves us so much that he gave us his word, the Bible. And in his word, the Bible, he tells us who he is so that we might, we might see him and know him, that the blindfolds might be off, and we might know who our God is and what he has done to save us. Right? In the Bible, God tells us how he sent his son Jesus into this world and how Jesus uh, lived a perfect life for us and then how Jesus died on the cross for us. And then what happened on Easter? We just celebrated this. What happened on Easter? He died. On e- I died on Good Friday, and then what happened on Easter? That tomb was empty, right? Because Jesus, he rose from the dead, right? And so the Bible tells all those great things that, that God has done for us in Jesus. And he tells us that in the Bible, and you know what else God does? He gives us other people in our, in our lives who tell us the truth of the word. Right? God has given you parents and grandparents, and Sunday school teachers, and, and pastors who, who tell you the truth of what, what God has done for you. And so now, since your eyes have been opened to know who Jesus is, that God has given you faith to trust in the Word, what do you think we should do? Now that God has given us the faith to, to, to believe and to know Jesus and who God is, what do you think we should do? What did Saul do? When he knew who God was, he was so excited about it, what did he do? He said the rest of his life, what did he do? Remember, Mila? Yeah, he went and he told everyone else. And so since our eyes have been opened to see and to know God, we should go and we should tell other people too, shouldn't we? All right, why don't we uh, close with prayer? Dear God, we thank you for giving us faith in our hearts, the faith to, to know and to believe and to see Jesus as our Savior and to know you as our true and loving God. Help us to tell other people about you and your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I right, thank you. you guys can return to your seats and we'll continue with the hymn of the day.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I saw a, a saying on social media recently. I think it was on Facebook. Uh, but it was a saying that, that a Christian friend had shared. And the saying went like this. It said, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It's a nice little saying, but could we actually believe it to be true? That, that if we lost everything, that if tomorrow everything that we had was taken away from us, we lost it all, but we still had Jesus. Could we really say that, that even then we still have everything, everything that we need? Again, it's easy to say, but not so easy to truly believe and, and to put into practice. Well, our, our second lesson for this morning, it seems to be giving a, a similar message. It, it tells us that everything else in this world is nothing when you compare it to Jesus. That take it all away and you would still have everything because you would still have Jesus. And, and so our second lesson, it encourages us then with with the greatest resolve, with the utmost zeal, to pursue Christ and the glory he has won for us. In other words, to live as though Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Well, if we are to live as though Jesus is our absolute everything, well, what is most important, first and foremost then, we must place our trust and our confidence fully and only in him that we must get rid of all senses of false confidence and all misplaced trust that would replace him. And, and as our second lesson begins, the Apostle Paul, he, he takes us back to his former life, back to a time in his life when he placed his confidence for his salvation squarely on himself. And the, the Apostle Paul, he makes the case that, that if heaven could be earned on the basis of what you do, well, then he would be a shoe in for heaven. And he, and he lays out for us his, his rather impressive resume. He writes that he was circumcised on the eighth day. So from the very beginning, from the time that he was a little infant, given strict adherence to the Old Testament laws. Right? So he is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was of pure Jewish descent. He could trace his lineage, his family line, all the way back to Abraham. He says, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. Now, no one, no one kept the law better than the Pharisees. They, they loved keeping the law. They were all about the law. In fact, they even added laws on top of God's laws just for good measure. And finally, he says, as for religious zeal, persecuted the church. Now, obviously, okay, persecuting the church, that's not a good thing. But Paul, formerly Saul, he was convinced that he was doing a good thing, that he was doing this for God. And so you certainly couldn't knock him for his religious zeal. Previously, Paul had considered all of those things good things, great things even. These are all things that would have been on his resume for him to be able to enter eternal life. He was very proud of these things. But not now. Right now, he says, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Everything that Paul was proud of, everything that his peers would have patted him on the back for and said, wow, Paul, what a good and godly and pious person you are. All of it now he considers to be a loss. In fact, he even goes on to call it garbage. Right? That, that stinky, smelly stuff, the the, the baby's diapers, the old spoiled food, all of that stuff that you drag out of your house and, and take to the curb once a week? Right, that's what Paul says. All of this stuff that was once so profitable and good to him is now, in his eyes. It is garbage. It's worthless. It's, it's a loss. And, and it was a loss. It was garbage, not because that stuff was bad in itself. Right, certainly being religiously zealous and, and, and giving obedience to God's commands, those are good things, great things even. But for Saul, they were a loss because they were not gaining for him the righteousness that he needed. And instead, all of those things were just leading him further away from the true righteousness that saves. See, Paul saw all of that stuff as his ticket to heaven. And since in his mind his ticket had already been punched, well, then he had no need 
for Christ. What about us? Can we boast a resume similar to Paul's? Maybe confirmed in the eighth grade? A church member of church members. Right, as it regards my, my zeal for church attendance, I hardly, if ever, miss. When it, when it comes to my service in church, well, the, the record, it is quite lengthy. All good things, right? Great things, even. I, I wish we all could have a resume like that. But if any of those things would become for us a source of our trust, our confidence before God, our ticket to heaven, well, then those things would be a loss. They would be for our own disadvantage. But of course, a person does not have to be uh, deeply religious. A person does not have to have a long history or record of service in the church in in order to to turn to themselves uh, for the basis of their own righteousness before God. Clearly, at least in our country, right, things are becoming, we might say, more and more secular. And while that's true, that zeal for self-righteousness that that Saul and the other Pharisees showed, well, that is alive and well. So there's a, an accusation that, that I've seen getting thrown around a lot lately, and maybe you've heard of it. It's, it's known as virtue signaling. And, and the whole idea behind virtue signaling is where, is where you, you, you signal or you display your virtue, your goodness for others. And the criticism is that's typically done in, in kind of shallow and meaningless ways, oftentimes in social media. And so, so really the, the whole accusation behind it is, is that you don't really actually care about the people involved, you don't actually care about the causes so much as you care about telling other people about how much you care. Now, this label of virtue signaling that's put on it, that might be a new label, at least it is new to me. But the whole idea behind it, that's not new at all, is it? It's as old as time. Because that's human nature, isn't it? That's what Saul and the Pharisees were doing 2,000 years ago, and it was being done long before that. And we ourselves, we we do that, right? We want other people to see how good and how virtuous and how morally superior we are. And what's more is we want to convince ourselves that we are so good and so virtuous and morally superior that God couldn't possibly be anything less than pleased with me. Hey, see God, see, see God how I volunteer in the community? God, see, see how I'm a, a faithful partner, a loving spouse, a, a good parent? Right, see, God, how, how I support all of the good things and how I stand against and oppose the bad things? I'm one of the good ones, God. And then we might also, we might also put our trust for our value before God and others, if not just in our virtue, our goodness, but we might also place it in our own accomplishments. And, and that might explain then why we can become so stressed out about our career, about our education, about school. We can become so stressed out about raising the perfect children. Because in those things, we, we can find all of our self-validation. In those things, we can boast and, and think, these are the things that, that give me value and worth before other people and before God. Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he looks at everything in his life before that, that was so important to him that, that he would have boasted and that he put his trust in. He looks back at all of that, and now he comes to a very different conclusion about it. And if we think about the things upon which we are tempted to boast, the things upon which we might build our trust, we can come to the same conclusion that Paul did. He says, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord, everything else by way of a comparison, it is a loss. Because nothing, nothing else in this world can give to us what Christ gives us. He gives us peace with God. He gives us an eternal future in glory. He gives us salvation. Have you ever seen one of those pawn show or pawn stars? I don't know what they call them all. There's a bunch of them. But those reality TV shows where they follow a pawn shop. So 
I don't know the name of the one that I've seen. I've seen a few episodes of it, but typically the show goes like this. Someone walks into the pawn shop with some item that they want to sell or pawn. And usually, again, it's, if it's going to be on the TV show, it's got to be some interesting item. And so usually it's some really old antique that has some historical significance or, or maybe some super rare collectible. And the person comes into the pawn shop, and of course the seller is always convinced that what they have, it is the real deal, right? It is real, it is genuine, and therefore, of course, it's going to be worth a lot of money. But of course, the owner of the pawn shop's not going to take their word for it, right? They, they, they don't want to lose out when it turns out it's not real at all. And so they'll bring in an expert to evaluate it. And the expert will look this item over, and it seems as though about half the time, the expert will say, much to the dismay of the seller, sorry, it's fake. Upon closer inspection, it's clearly a counterfeit. It's a sham. It's, it's worth nothing. Well, that is what our lesson for this morning does to any false sense of self-righteousness before God that we might have. It exposes it as a sham, as a fake, a phony. It's worth nothing. You know, at the end of the day, when you boil it all down, there is really two kinds of, of righteousness before God. There is the righteousness that comes from us that is based upon our own worthiness, our own merits, our own goodness. And then there is the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Christ. Again, the, the righteousness that comes from us, it is a sham. It's a phony. It's counterfeit. And, and under scrutiny, it's revealed to be a fraud. Right? That, that virtue, that goodness that we try so desperately to hold out for other people to see, for God to see, under closer inspection, it's a faulty facade. A desperate attempt to try to cover up a heart and mind that is polluted with sin. But the righteousness that comes from Christ, that is through faith, well, that is a righteousness that is true and genuine and real. And we can be sure that it will be revealed as such on the day of judgment. It is a righteousness that comes not from ourselves, but from Christ. It comes from his perfect life lived in our place. It comes from his sacrificial death on the cross for us. You know, really, we, we might sum up the big difference in Paul's life, that before, his confidence before God was based upon the thought that he had given his very best for God. But now, his confidence before God was based upon the sure knowledge that God had given his very best, his son, for him. And that is our confidence as well. Through Christ, we know with absolute certainty we are made holy, we are perfect. We stand as righteous and holy before God now and forever. However, we should be clear, and our lesson does make it very clear, that being found now in saving faith in Christ, being now wrapped in Christ's holiness and his righteousness, that does not now mean that, that we can just coast until we are in heavenly glory. The Apostle Paul, he looks ahead and he anticipates that heavenly glory, and this is what he has to say about it. He says, not that I have already obtained all this, or that I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Being found in saving faith and being made holy through our Savior by faith, that is not the end of the story. It's really just the beginning of the story. Right? The moment that Christ enters our hearts in faith, that is the beginning of our fight of faith. Right? We are at that moment put on the starting blocks, the gun goes off, and we are off to the races to heavenly glory. You know, and the Apostle Paul, he, he makes clear here that he does not consider himself to be a finished product. That at no point in time while he is on this earth could he ever say, that's it, right? I'm, I'm done now, I'm good. No, in, instead he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I realize that Paul learned from the risen Lord himself. He knew the power of Christ and his resurrection. He wrote about it. He expounded upon it in great detail in his letters to the churches. He, he wrote about how that because Christ has been raised, that we too will be raised. 
He he wrote that because Christ was raised, that is our assurance that that the atonement for our sins has been paid in full. Paul knew the risen Lord. He knew him well. He knew the power of the resurrection. Paul says, I want to know him even better. I want to know my risen Lord better and better, and I want to know more fully what that resurrection means for me. And, And he says, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You can realize, at the moment Paul is writing these words, he is sitting in a prison for preaching the gospel. He knows what it means to suffer for Christ. He knows what it means to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Paul knew he experienced it firsthand. Jesus promised to his disciples when he said, because the world hates me, it's going to hate you too. Paul was experiencing that at that very moment. And yet he says, I, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in Christ's suffering. You know, we, we might be tempted to say to him, Paul, at what point do you say enough is enough? At, at what point do you just kind of put your feet up and relax and coast a little bit? Say, Paul, I, I, I think your place in heaven is pretty safe and secure now. But No, Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. You know, I think the argument, a strong argument, could be made that the greatest threat to our spiritual life of faith is spiritual apathy and complacency. Maybe a a false sense of comfort from from simply having our name in the church membership directory. Maybe that that gives us a false sense of comfort and security so that we let our guard down. Or or, or maybe, you know, there are just so many things that can distract us and pull us in so many different directions. Again, many of them might be very important things. But might some of those things be pulling us away from time in the Word? And a faith that is not being fed by the Word is a faith that is slowly becoming more and more weak and apathetic. Our lesson is clear. Now is not the time to let up. Now is not the time to take it easy. No, instead we need to have the attitude of that of the Apostle Paul. As he said, I want to know Christ better. I want to be like him in his death. Meaning that, that just as Christ put to death my sins on the cross, well, so too I want to put to death my sinful nature with all of its passions, with all of its desires. And, and I want to know better the power of his resurrection. Right? I've heard the Easter story before. I've heard it thousands of times. But it's not just some old boring story. Right? I want to know it better. I want to hear it again and again. And I want to be assured again and again of what the resurrection of Christ means. That because that tomb is empty, It means that that there is victory over sin, death, and the devil, and that that's a victory that Christ has won for me. And so let's press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of you. And as we close, I just want to close with what I think is an important point. Notice that he says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. So, Aaron, my youngest son, he really likes to walk on balance beams. And so if we're at the park and there's a balance beam, generally he's going to be running right towards it. And he's only two years old, so he can barely walk normally. So, of course, if he's on a balance beam, you've got to hold his hand. Make sure he doesn't fall over the edge. And, and if Aaron, if he starts to sense that he's tipping one way or the other, right, you can feel his little hand right, will grip more tightly onto your hand to keep himself from falling. Or that's what he thinks. Right, he's under the impression that it is his grip on my hand that is keeping him from falling over the edge. Of course, his grip is really adding nothing to the equation, right? It is because I am holding his hand. It's because I have hold of him. That is what is keeping him from falling. You, know, you, you and I, we, we might think that, that we must hold on to Christ and his righteousness with all of our strength and with all of our power and that, that we must just hold on to him with this, with this white-knuckled death grip. And and we should, right? That is the encouragement that comes out of our lesson here. But at the end of the day, we have the promise that the holding power is actually coming from the other direction. Christ has taken hold of you. He has taken hold of you. He has covered you in his righteousness. He has hold of you and he promises he will not let you go. And so if you have Christ and he has hold of you, Even if you were to lose everything else tomorrow, if everything else was gone, if you have Christ and he has you, then we can say, I have everything. 
Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we'll continue by confessing our faith together. Uh, and this morning we'll use the words of the Nicene Creed, uh, printed on page 6. We confess. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not me, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no way. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We'll continue with responsive prayer on page 7. Almighty and merciful God, in this Easter season, we rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Increase our faith that the message of the empty tomb may fill our lives and make us glad each day. When we are weak, be our strength. When we are sad, be our song. And when we sin, be our salvation. Remove the hurt of death from all who mourn. In moments of grief, call believers through the voice of our Good Shepherd and embolden us to follow his promises. In their hopelessness of despair, turn the faithless to trust in the only way, truth, and life. Wipe away tears born of death and give new birth to a living hope in the hearts of the lost and troubled. Use our witness as compassion and comfort for others in need of mercy. King of kings and Lord of lords, destroy all dominion, authority, and power that stands against you, whether seen or unseen. Whatever evil exerts itself against your, your saving will, but be false teaching or lukewarm faith, Satan lies or worldly pleasures, empty worship or futile religion, rule it, for the sake of the gospel's free course. Triumph over our enemies and empower the church to fight the good fight to the end. Never leave us or forsake us. Walk among our churches, O living one, as the faithful witness and firstborn from the dead. As you sent your disciples with the breath of the Spirit, call those in our church, full of the Spirit and wisdom, to administer the keys of the kingdom. Wherever we live and whatever we do, help us to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that we have in Christ. Heavenly Father, keep the baptized united with your Son in his resurrection. Put to death the fleshly urges of those caught in addictions. Clothe in your righteousness anyone ashamed of good intentions which have fallen short. And assure those searching for purpose that their eternal identity as your dear children is sealed. Thank you for the power of baptism working in our lives and for the certainty of its promises through the resurrection. Enrich us with everything we need for life and godliness. And we ask that you hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence.
O Lord of life, you have done mighty things for us. We pray through him who is the beginning and the end, Jesus Christ, our Lord. His name is above every name, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We'll join together in the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we join in our closing hymn, Hymn 510, In Christ Alone. Amen. 